this week on Rockstar Superhero. Every so often, I get lucky enough to interview a true force of nature where I'm doing all I can to hang on for the ride. That was my experience today as I spoke to John Sinfield of the UK Upstarts, Memorist. John has a lot to say and gave me wonderfully eloquent and thoughtful answers to my oddly phrased questions. It was a joy to hear his take on everything from family loss to the surprising catharsis of swimming in pools of fecal matter. We'll let you percolate on that image for a while and give nothing away, but rest assured this interview is a ton of fun and full of wonderful surprises. John is going to be a legendary frontman because he's already a legendary human. This much is evident. This is my conversation with the singer and lyricist of Memorist, John Sinfield, on the Rockstar Superhero Podcast. Well, I, I don't even live in the Southwest anymore. So I actually live in the West Midlands now, which is the West of the middle of it. Uh, um, of course. <laughs> but uh, the rest of the guys, they, they live kind of scattered. So um, a few of them live in a town called Bridgewater, um, which is a kind of an old um, industrial town. Um, and right. then one of the guys lives in Bristol, um, which is an old um, like port, like sh- uh, shipping town, really famous for the shipping lanes. Mm-hmm. Um, and then one of the other guys lives in a place called Western Supermare, so, which is like a oh. seaside town. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know right where that's at. Oh, you do? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I recently, I know this sounds really strange, but I recently interviewed a band called Weston Super Mame, and they're from London. Right. And I thought right. maybe it was a riff on the name, but they thought, no, it's just a really stupid name. That's why they went with it. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, yeah, yeah that, that's that's why the, the Southwest thing. Um, yeah, it's just the Southwest Lee Parving, and that's all. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Isn't Wales? It's funny because I'm a Jones, right? My last name is actually Jones. Um, Rob Leland is my middle name. It's very Tommy Lee sort of thing. Right. Um, but, (laughs) but that being said, um, you know, the Jones names comes from Wales and I've always made the assumption that Wales was on the coast, the West coast of England. Is, is that true? Because I actually, I don't know. Yeah, so Wales is its own country, um, and oh, that okay. is, is so it comes off. So you've got England kind of in the middle, yeah, and then I'm I'm reversed. This is tricky, but yeah, no, west can... of west of England um, <laughs> is this this big old landmass called Wales. Wales. Wales is beautiful, man. Like Wales has got uh, mountains. It's got like huge open countryside. It's got seaside towns. It's got um, like I used to go climbing. I used to, I used to do a lot of rock climbing. So I used to do a lot of rock climbing in Wales. Um, yeah, Wales is Wales is beautiful, um, and they've got uh, some some fun accents as well. In fact, I was in Wales um, <laughs> only a couple of months ago on holiday. Um, oh that's a that's a British favourite. Yeah, yeah. I, I I know this is a weird way to start this interview, but the but the fact is is I don't really know. It's amazing. I'm 55 years old. You would think I would know where Wales is, but you know I've never been there. And my assumption actually was the country it was more like the countryside it was a region it wasn't necessarily a, a country so i really didn't know that until just now which makes me look really stupid <laughs> well to be honest man like when it comes to the us i'm like you got canada yeah. and the northern bit you've got the, sure. the greenish bit in the middle and then you've got the, <laughs> the where, where all the guns are at down the bottom yeah. right yeah that's yeah. true there are guns everywhere sadly but uh yeah it's a lot the majority more, a lot of them more are guns down there and a bit more sand <laughs> Yeah, down that way. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, if you don't mind, uh, as I was saying to you right before we started rolling, um, one of the components, one of the things I really look at is the members of a musical unit because you can have the music, but you can't have the music, of course, without the person. And that combination of individuals it what is what gives birth to, in your case, memorist. Um, but I would love to know, if you don't mind sharing a little bit about this, 
tell me a little bit about your earlier years. You know, uh, what it was like at your home, influences around your family, um, or sure. if you if you found your artistic muse, you know, somewhere else. Yeah, sure. Um, so only one half of my family um, is inherently musical. My mum is, I mean, she's, she's tone deaf. Um, mm. But my dad was a musician. So my dad always played uh, growing up. He was a guitar player. And he sang a little bit. Um, and he used to play a lot, play guitar a lot with me when I was a kid and, and sing to me. Um, we'd always sing Pretty Woman. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, that was a big part of my life. Um, and unfortunately, my dad um, was diagnosed with um, terminal cancer when I was four. Oh, um my. So he died. Um, funny enough, actually, one of the last things we did together was we went, we we bought a motor home and we went on a, um, a three, four, five month, six month trip around America. We went to uh, pretty much every state. Um, wow. But yeah, he he died when I was, um, it was five five or six years old, um, and I got into music. I, I I picked up his old guitars when I was really young um, as kind of a way of reconnecting, I guess, in, mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, dabbled here and there throughout. Um, but that that was really what what kind of tied me into music from an early age was 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 singing with my dad, um, wow. and that's it's just kind of stuck with me. I mean, music's always been a massive part of my life, even when I haven't been playing. Um, and I've learned loads of instruments over the years, and then eventually couldn't find a singer for one of my bands, and went, ah, I'll give it a go, um, and here we are. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're fantastic. You're you're truly fantastic. I, uh, I, yeah. I told your promo director. I said I, I got to have them on the show. I mean, that voice is just <laughs> so next level. Um, and everybody knows this. Anybody who listens to my show, I say this every time. But I never have anybody on the show that I don't really truly enjoy. So thank you from my from the deepest parts of my heart. I, it's it's really an honor. Um, oh, thanks, man. Yeah. Uh, well, it sounds then, I mean, if I could just touch on that a little bit, because it's a, it's a curiosity for me. Um, I lost my father to cancer as well. Um, not, not nearly as young as you did. Um, but it seems to me that, you know, your father's passing, obviously it's going to leave a hole in your heart and in your soul. It's just, a, it's a huge part of who we are, our parents. Mm -hmm. Um, but it also, it's lovely because what you're telling me is you're carrying on your father his DNA, his experience, his his inborn skills. So you're proof that um, I don't want to get religious here, but your name means gift from God. I don't know if you've mm. ever looked that up. Um, yeah, but in Hebrew, right? And yeah, and I think about that, and I think about your father passing, and how basically it's like you've been injected into society to carry on what was what was put into him right it's it's part of who you are what are you, what are your thoughts on that i think that's a really nice idea um i mean i'm i'm fascinated by um th there's this this kind of parallel between not parallel sorry a, a dichotomy between learned behaviors and mm -hmm. um this kind of theory that you can have almost imprinted in your dna imprinted in your being um the mannerisms or the uh things that your parents do and people mm -hmm. always argue that well you learn those things you know if you pull the same faces as your parents it's because you've seen your parents pull those faces but right. I'm, my mum says to me all the time she's like you do things that your dad did mm -hmm. that you never would have seen because you were too young mm -hmm. you know you never you never hold on to those things you know I'll, I'll say something in a certain way or i'll pull a face in a certain way um that is exactly how how my dad would have done something so yeah i i, I really like that idea i mean I, i'm not religious or or really even inherently spiritual um mm -hmm. But agnostic, maybe. It's probably a better way to describe it. <laughs> it's fine, it. however you are, man. I was, I was just using it as a reference point. I hope that yeah. wasn't offensive. No, not in the least bit. Oh, good, good. Yeah, it's, it, is, it seems to be so true, right? You meet families who are, for example, quite wealthy. And you realize that a lot of that is, is nurture, right? They've, they've trained mm -hmm. their children how to continue on their business legacy because they know in a sense those secrets that aren't sort of readily handed about right yeah. but yeah the beauty of dna is is especially it seems that it comes into artists this way because i don't believe artistry is trained in yes i do believe you when you discover you want to be or you want to pursue the artist nature 
you're going to make attempts to be better, right? You're going to practice, you're re- going to, re- you know, rehearse a specific instrument, you're going to pick something and, and, and let it challenge you, but you're going to try to grow it. So you can right become extraordinary to be exceptional. Um, sure. But but that inherent artistry, I mean, there's a reason it's called inherent, it's born in you don't just, you know, like you said, your dad gave it to you, man, and, and your mom doesn't even know how it happens. But here you are. Yeah making a certain face that very clearly your father would have done. Mm. It's incredible, John. Thank you for sharing that. No, it's okay. That's, yeah. That's um, a very, that's a very good question, Rob. I've never had a question like that before. <laughs> well, good. I could tell you were a little thrown off and I thought, okay, wait a minute here. <laughs> Is this a bad moment? <laughs> no, no, that was good. Oh, cool. Well, let's get to the meat and the juice of this thing. Um, memorist. Uh, how did you guys come together? I know you haven't been together that long. I mean, you're just now getting ready to release your first EP, but mm-hmm. you know, what was the catalyst to put you boys together? Um, funny enough, actually, um, it was our photographer. So um, if we kind of rewind a little bit, um, Chris, our guitar player, well, we, we've all of us been in bands when we were younger. So we're, we're an average age of 30, right? Okay. Um, right. You know, we, we've got proper, proper jobs. Um, yeah. and we'd, we'd, we'd all done the band thing. Like we'd all toured, we'd all had like small record deals and, and we kind of, it all fizzled out and we kind of put it to rest and we like, we had families and, um, and Chris, I didn't know any of the guys, not a single one of them. Um, and Chris was getting married in Vegas. Mm. Wow. Um, and he took a photographer with him who he was friends with from his town. And that photographer who he took with him knew another photographer who also happened to be in Vegas at the time. And messaged this guy, Ollie, and was like, hey, do you want to come along and, and shoot some photos in the Nevada desert? Like, this would be really cool. We've got some choppers and, you know, some hot rods and, like, we're going to do some donuts in the desert and it's going to be cool. And this guy, Ollie, uh, <laughs> was like, yeah, that, that's sick. I'll come take some photos. Now, I know Ollie. Ollie is a drummer. Um, and I did a guest vocal on one of his band's tracks in, like, 2012. Mm-hmm. So we're talking, like, nine years ago. Um, when I was in another band, I was in a tech metal band called Chronographs at the time. Um, and yeah, uh, they got to, got to talk in, Chris and Ollie and a couple of the other guys, and were like talking about music. And Chris saying, oh, you know, I haven't played music in so long. And his wife, who's super supportive, was like, you should do something. Like, you, should, you know, you should write some stuff. And a couple of guys had been and riffing a little bit and uh, had some ideas. And they said to Ollie, do you want to play drums for us? And Ollie was like, yeah, that'd be really cool. Um, they were like, oh, we just need a singer. Um, and Ollie was like, I know this guy. He hasn't done anything in years, um, but like I think you, I think you'd like him. I think you'd get on. Um, I think he kind of brings to the table the sort of thing you're looking for. I'll drop him a message. Um, Ollie dropped me a message. We met up for beers, and the rest is history. Um, and like we're, we're well, I say the rest is history. Ollie doesn't even play drums for us. He never did. Um, he got he 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 is a very successful photographer. Um, he does a lot of work with models. He flies all over the world all the time. All the time. Yeah. Um, so he never really had time for it. Um, sure. But incidentally, he is now our photographer. So, you know, that 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 worked out ni- nicely that way. But yeah, I mean, the, we're all like the best of friends now. Um, wow. For guys I didn't even know just over three years ago. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's it's been a journey. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like, but it seems to me, at least listening to your voice, it seems to me you were prepared for this journey. Yeah, sure. I mean, I've, I've always kept my toe in, you know, I've always, I've always written music for myself. Or, um, I don't never really release anything. I mean, I've got loads of songs that I've written and recorded and, and, and mixed and I've never released. So no. yeah, it wasn't like a, Oh God, what am I going to do? I haven't, I haven't sung in years. Um, no. You know, like I said, music's always been a massive part of my life. So even when I'm driving to and from work, I'd sing in the car um, yeah. and I challenge myself that way. And I, you know, I try and listen to bands like, I don't know if there's a, a band called Circus Survive. Do you know who they are? Yeah. 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 So An- Anthony Green's one of my vocal idols. Like, oh, he wow. Sings like a little girl and it terrifies <laughs> me. And I'm like, right, how do I do that? How, do, yes. how, can, I, how can I sing like that? Um, yeah, when, they, when they came a knock in, I was like, right, okay, yeah, let's give this a shot. And yeah, we, we just we roll with it. Oh, man. That's fantastic. So you mentioned you have a whole bunch of songs sort of off to the side, things you've put together. Are they fully mm-hmm. formed or are they just on b- piano or guitar or are they just vocal melodies? What's your, you know, what's your library look like? A, a mixture. I mean, I write 
I mean, so I've got, like I said, I play a lot of instruments. So kind of mm -hmm. down here to my right is my, my guitar rack. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I have lots of things that are guitar based. Um, but I also really like electronic music. Um, I like, I, I have a, a, a habit of writing rap beats and then never doing anything with them mm. uh, because I can't rap. Right. Um, I, tr I tried it once and it was embarrassing and I'm never going to do it ever again. Um, and then, yeah, there are some things that I've literally just written like a string quartet and I've sung over it or yeah, in some cases it's just, a, it's just a melody. Like it, it really, there's, there's a whole <laughs> range of things yeah. that I've, I've done and haven't finished or have finished and just haven't released. Um, yeah. That's awesome. So the band doesn't uh, balk at that, right? They encourage you to bring some of that stuff in or do you, as a unit, do you write from ground zero? Uh, we, we, the way we write is actually, I think it's probably becoming ever more common now. Um, we write remotely. like Right. So each of us pretty much has our own studio. Um, I've got my studio here that I'm in, my office, my studio. Uh, Chris has got one at his house. Ash has got one that he works out because he's a producer and he's our producer. Um, Craig, our synth guy, um, has one at his house. Um, our bass player kind of has a little rudimentary one and, and, and our drummer has a setup as well. So it's it's actually kind of similar to the way Linkin Park used to write stuff back in the yeah. 90s, like the early 2000s. You know, we'd, we'd I'll come up with maybe a synth pad. Um, in fact, Slither, the song we've just released, mm -hmm. it literally came about that way. Um, I sat down and I wrote the synth pad and I modulated it and made it wobble and was like, this is cool. And then I wrote a little 80s kind of bass riff and um, then threw some beats on it. And then I sent it to the other guys. I was like, what can you do with this? Right. And then it became a song. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we all kind of do our own little bits and then chip bits in. And then if it doesn't get used, then it will end up being one of mine or yeah. and, I'll, and I'll probably never release it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I understand that. I mean, it makes sense, too, because, I mean, of course, you told me at the very beginning of this that, you know, half of the band is on the other side, basically, in a sense, on the other side of the country. If, if you mm. know, one of the musicians is Western Supermare, yeah, that's not exactly, a, a, you know, a, a jaunt to your house. That's a that's a that's a day trip. You know, that's a commitment. Yeah, yeah, totally, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm curious about the descriptions of your sound. Um. I've read a few different things about them over the past couple of weeks. Um, and I don't know if I agree with all of them, but it okay. seems to me, cause there's so many sub genres nowadays, right? So many, yeah. you know, me metal core and post hardcore, all the different core terms, everything is bonkers to me where alt metal seems to be the best descriptive of your sound and approach. I mean, you clearly have synth wave, type of feelings in there mm -hmm. like there's bits and pieces of that especially with the the big epic you know choruses the big breakdowns but you guys twisted around quite a bit um and i'm hesitant to use the word new metal uh but i've seen it in reference to your material and of course you know you just talked about lincoln park i personally think new metal is some of the best stuff ever made I don't care about, you know, how people feel about, I don't know, you know, pick a new metal band. I don't have a problem with any of that. I'm friends with some of the guys in some of these new metal bands that are, you know, big, famous bands. Um, I think new metal is actually the closest we can say about your band. Is that offensive term to you? No, we love new metal. Um, like, you know, uh, <laughs> we, all, we all have our different favorites, but like we're kids in the 90s. Yeah, you know, um, I grew up in baggy slipknot jeans and listening to Hybrid Theory and, um, you know, like uh, DJs and mixing decks in, in in music when I was a kid was like that was the thing, mm -hmm. and I I wanted a pair of decks and I wanted to know how to mix and I wanted to know how to beat juggle and like it was it was a crossover culture man like it brought together hip hop and metal and and all of the kind of like weird subgenres in between yeah no that's not offensive at all and we. I mean, we have we have self described as new metal, right? Um, but are hesitant to do so because purists go, "Now nah, you're a metalcore band." <laughs> yeah, like, so I'm talking we just make about music, man. Like we just make music, and and there are industrial elements in it that kind of. I mean, some of the stuff on the empiric, like the sounds that you you can't even really hear. Like I yeah. I, I I added like twenty odd layers of industrial percussion to that song. Mm. You listen to it, it sounds like coal chamber, like. Yeah. It, it doesn't, you know, and if you listen to some of our choruses, if you break it down, like to all the layers, it literally sounds like, like there's some Linkin Park elements in there. 
Mm. So not at all offensive. Really happy you've said that. And I think you'll probably really like what comes after the EP, but I won't say Good. much more on that. Good. Well, the fact that you even teased that just now is super cool. Um, something I've been wanting to ask, I'm really curious about is you seem to be somehow somebody in the band who is part of the design aspect of what you put out in your logos, in your, you know, just the creations, the visual creations seem to be influenced by Japanese culture. Yes. Um, uh, how come I'm seeing kanjis on the single art? It, where does that come from? Um, so the, the designer for pretty much everything is me. Oh, cool. So I, I do pretty much all the stuff in house. I can't take credit for our logo. Um, so actually, the one that's below me right now, that's actually mm -hmm. our old logo. I can, oh. I can take credit for that one. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I should it's okay. It. No, don't worry. Um, but our new one was designed by a guy called Jack Nickel. He runs a studio called Iron Giant Design, and he's amazing. Like I, I outsourced to him because I knew he would come up with something completely bespoke, completely unique, and that would be fantastic. Yeah. Um, the, the influence of Japanese culture is interesting. You're the first person to actually question me about that. Um, I've always been fascinated by Japanese culture. I've always been fascinated, but well, I've never been. I've always been fascinated by Asian culture in general. Mm. Um, I've always been fascinated by Japanese mythology. Um, and in fact, one of the very first bands that I formed was named after, um, I mean, we thought we were really cool at the time. Um, <laughs> we, we named it after the rope that was used to seal the gates of hell. Mm. Um, in Japanese, and I even like screamed in Japanese in some of the songs because I was like, "This is a culture that is so far removed from what we have in this country." Mm -hmm. um, but they have such elegant ways to describe things, you know. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I really like this idea. Um, so the EP is, as, as everyone knows now, it's called Oni Kijo, Oni Kijo, mm -hmm. um, which literally means demon she demon or demon witch right mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. and the the whole ep the theme is kind of this uh this exploration of the idea that um who, who is the bad one right is it and it, it is uh, rooted mainly around a toxic relationship that i was in and, and the events that happened as a result of being involved in that and afterwards mm -hmm. um and you know am i am i the, the demon am i oni or is she kijo um, and that's the, the route that the EP takes. Um, the use of kanji is you can use a symbol, a picture. And this is why I like design so much. Mm -hmm. You can use a picture to say so many things. Uh, shapes are emotive. Colors are emotive. Words are great, but we're so used to seeing words. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, we have on, on the singles because we were advised and people have said to me, well, if you just put kanji on the front then people won't know what the song's called. And I'm like, yeah, okay, fine. So I made it really small and put it underneath. <laughs> I I'm like, you're going to, you're going to be listening on Spotify. It's going to tell you in English. Come mm -hmm. on, man. Um, and the kanji are, are, are you know, they they are loosely related to the song titles, mm -hmm. um, but they're not always exactly the same thing. So the empiric, the, the kanji there is, is literally for plague um, mm -hmm. uh, or, or kind of pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. The kanji for second sequence is, um, yeah, I think it means uh, se second born child or, or, or my son. Mm. Um, uh, Sliver is a serpent. Mm -hmm. uh, the next track, Kijo, obviously, She Demon. And then the final track that we, we, we will be releasing um, on the 12th of November with the EP um, and the final music video, which we're actually filming on Friday, two days from awesome. now. Awesome. Awesome. Um, is uh, that is demon? You know, um, only is is quite ubiquitous in in Western culture now. Um, you know, thanks to anime and and, and, yeah. and that sort of stuff and, and manga. Um, but yeah, that that's the real reason for the, for that being in there. Um, it, it's it's just I, I like the way it looks and yeah, it 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 it, 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 it says things that I want to say without having to say it in words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and, if, and it forces examination. I mean, if you care, mm -hmm. if you're a listener and you care about what you're listening to, don't you want to know more, right? Yeah. I want to investigate. Now, granted, the reason I even brought this up is because I'm married to a Japanese woman. Really? So, yes. And so I've been to Japan a number of times and I know of which you speak in regards, especially to demon guardians, as an example. Um, you know, if you go outside the major temples, there's usually two demons standing guard at the gates. Um, and what's interesting is Japanese culture suggests 
that demonic entities, not angelic entities, are the guardians. Demons are the warriors. In other words, angels are soft. Yeah, they're not they're not going to be doing anything we need. The demons are going to help us. And I find that really interesting and oddly subversive. You know what I mean? And and coming from America where there's this sort of a the the traditional thinking in America is we are a Christian nation, right? I mean, sure, of course we're a melting pot. We have all these things, but you know, the argument seems to be from ex- certainly the extreme right that we are a Christian nation, which I I don't agree with at all. Um, that said, I grew up in the church, right? So my brain, when I see these things, I say, well, that's a curious take. <laughs> mm. But I love that you've thought about this. You know, you've sought out to understand it, John. And and yeah, the designs are simple, but there's a lot of subtext in those kanjis. A lot of people don't realize those are literally drawings of their visualizations of the thing they're talking about. Yeah. Right. Gates of heaven, all these different things. So I just love the approach. I really, it wasn't a question as much as I just really wanted to say how badass it was. (laughs) Oh, thanks, man. (laughs) Yeah, I love it. Um, Look, I heard the Empiric. Um, I know that's not the latest release, but it it is a newer song of yours, of course, from the last 12 months. Um, And I think it's a wonderful example of what you do. Um, and really why I wanted you on the show and why I think you're going to take the top spot on the pedestal somewhere. Um, I think when people discover you, when they really take the time to say, wait a minute, what was that? That was that made me feel comfortable. That made me rock. But it also made me listen because there's there's subtleties and there's nuances because it comes from a band that is new, right? Memorist is a new thing. So therefore, you can go with some of the tried and true new metal sort of approaches, but you're going to bring your own juice to it, if that makes sense, right? Um, The song is grand in theme. It it has an actual musical design. It has very clear production. Um, And the tones during the breakdown are a big surprise, right? Like you guys just... Yeah, you do something really different. You don't go to the obvious. You're not on the one, for example. It's very atonal, in fact, in the breakdown on that particular piece. Um, and my question after my long intro here is, did that song come easier than some of your other material? Because it seems like it's it's just got hit written all over it. Uh, that's a, this is a contentious question, not because you've asked it, but because of the way some people in the band feel about it. So Gotcha. The Empiric was written um, by Chris, our guitar player, and me, predominantly, okay. um, remotely over Zoom and FaceTime during the start of the first lockdown in this country. Um, and we started experimenting with different sounds, um, one of which being that we now, I mean, this isn't even really a secret, a lot of bands do it, but we layer pretty much every guitar riff. Mm-hmm. There's a guitar riff, and then there's a synth that sits directly underneath it, which fills out all of the resonant frequencies that you just don't get from a guitar. Right. Guitars are great. Like, we've heard distorted guitars for decades, yeah? Um, Sabbath started it, and, and you know, Eagles of Death Metal, whatever. <laughs> now, it's, it's done, man. Like, I've heard so many breakdowns of bands chugging away in drop C, and, like, it's, it's, just, it's just dull. Um, so... Yeah, we, we kind of forged a way of doing that. And there were certain things we wanted to try, this introduction of like more electronic elements, more industrial elements as we talked about. Um, it, I don't want to say it came easier okay. because I don't think it was, I don't think it came easier. I think because me and Chris believed in it so much, we pushed for it. There you go. Uh, we, we really pushed for that. And like, you know, it, it sounds really egotistical, but like, Ash guitar player was like, I want to change that part. And we went, no, like you're not changing that part. Our drummer uh, wanted to play something slightly differently, like the opening riff. Um, and I was like, now nah, it loses, it loses the drive. It has to be done this way. Mm-hmm. And that's the first time we've really done that. Like generally we're quite free and loose and everyone can have their own input. But yeah, that one, we put our foot down a little bit mm-hmm. and actually most of the guys didn't like it. They didn't mm-hmm. like the song. They were like, we don't, we don't really dig it. We don't, we don't know what it's about. Like, we don't think people will like it. And, you know, it, it went. <sighs> um, so, 
yeah, it's been a it's that that's why it was a contentious question. Um, yeah, but yeah, I mean, it, it, th- there's another song yet to come, which which is only which is the, the final track, which I think is probably on a similar footing, um, and I think I think that one came probably the easiest. Yeah, are you bookending the album with the two pieces? No, uh, okay. so the EP opens with Oni, mm. ends with Kijo. Oh, oh, oh. Um, and it, okay, gotcha. So it kind of follows that um, story. So to speak. Yeah, yeah, that theme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's interesting too. I, I guess then that leads to the, to a question that I have to ask: is is usually bands they want to have a democratic approach as a band in songwriting. You know, everybody wants to have their bit. They want to be able to bring it in. And Mm. that's where a lot of the battles come from. But secretly behind the scenes, I don't know one drummer, for example, that doesn't think they have probably the best ear for arrangement, right? We, I'm a drummer. We tend to have great arrangement ears. We tend to be listening for how a phrase should work, but past Mm. that, I'm not I'm not really picking between A flat and you see what I'm saying? I mean, I'm not really mm. thinking necessarily of the melodic structure. I just know what works in my ears and what doesn't. Do you, in a sense, then sort of put your foot down? Because clearly you felt so strongly about the empiric, but but as a unit, I would imagine that eventually creates some dissonance that you don't want to have to overcome every time you write a song. Um in in some cases, uh, yeah, you'd be right. I mean, generally, we we kind of strike quite a good balance in terms of that democracy. Uh, mm. You know, everything being so, we use Google Drive a lot. You mm. know, and and you know, other storage facilities are available. Um, we've used Dropbox as well. Um, but yeah, because the stuff's always in there. Like, we'll come up with a little idea, um, and we'll dump it there and go, "What do you guys think?" And then it's more of like a verbal input. So I think we should do this, or I think we should do this. Mm. Um, and when we write over Zoom or FaceTime or um, or any other <laughs> video stuff, we, we get to have that input. Um, there are certain parts where, you know, the guitar has been written in that way, and it would really be best if the drums did this. Um, and, you know, we're flexible. Like, I've had some of the guys come back to me and go, I don't like that vocal melody. And I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll tweak it. Um, oh, can you sing that a bit softer? Can you sing that a bit harsher? And mm-hmm. I'll go, okay, I'll do another, I'll do another take. Um, mm. Because ultimately, it's about what sounds good. So um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and the pre-production aspect of it, obviously, it's just it's everything from it. You know, it's actually the songwriting process, but it also saves you down the road when you're in the studio because you're you're prepared in advance. You don't have to test out different ideas. You've you've figured as a unit, right? This is what works. This is what we're going to stick to. And because you have an in-house producer, you're already ready to go, right? Yeah, exactly. That's cool. Um, when it comes to lyrics, um, mm-hmm. this is something. Uh, so I'm a drummer, as I had shared a little while ago. I'll be the first person to tell you I rarely listen to lyrics. I, I, I'm just busy focused on the rhythms and right the syncopation, things that are happening, in a sense, in the support of the melody. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've found the lyrics. I've I read you know I have read some because I wanted to be prepared for our conversation today. Um, I assume you're the primary writer of the lyrics, the creative force behind that. Yeah, yeah. All the lyrics come from me. Okay, all of them. Okay, well that's yeah. great. Well, so one of the things then I'd read on your Bandcamp page, um, you know, referenced painful themes of human emotion and. Mm-hmm. You know, you 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 stated earlier that you're all sort of roughly 30 years old. You're right in that range where you've gone through some of the youthful angst you've experienced, the, the troubling aspects of being a young person. And now yeah. in a lot of ways, you're growing out of it and you're moving forward into your you know full adulthood. Um, yeah. What issues or experiences are the driving force behind your lyrics and did their creation heal you or are you still working it out? Um, very good question. Um, so mm-hmm. all of the things I write about, uh, the whole idea of Memorist was to invite people into and share in my memories, my experiences. 
um, and to to allow that to kind of resonate with people in their own way. I mean, if you go way back before any of our our, our most recent singles to our first release, Loss, um, that was about a very close friend of mine dying. Um, mm. He was uh, a young man who died at the age of twenty nine, just completely unexplained. Yeah. Um, incidentally, he's actually was actually my tattoo artist, so that, oh. most of the work on me was from him. Um, wow. And that song was about me dealing with with his death and 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 how how it affected me, how it affected his family, kind of the gap he left, um, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and then there's, there's been a whole range of things since then, you know. Uh, but a lot of this most recent EP, um, as I said earlier, has been about a, a very very difficult, very toxic relationship that I'm no longer in, um, and the period, the the, the 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 events of kind of the last eighteen. 18 to 24 months really um and the way that's affected my life and um the life of my children Mm -hmm. um and the the way in which i write about things it it is a cathartic process you know it's Mm -hmm. it's music has always been therapeutic for me whether that's listening to it or writing it um and I'd, i'd love to say that you know i write about something and then that's it that's it dealt with um some of the time it is you know, some of the time I write something and I'm like, okay, that, that thing, I can put that thing to rest now. Mm-hmm. Um, but even then, sometimes something else brings it back up again in the future. Um, you know, I, I don't believe that time is inherently linear. I believe it's it's relatively cyclical, especially in our, in our human experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, and even if you process something, you know, you go to therapy or, you know, do whatever. <laughs> right. You ultimately at some point in your life that's going to pop back up again you know that person that that hurt you or that wronged you there's going to be a reminder at some point um Mm -hmm. you know or 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 whatever else um so yeah music is a healer music for me is definitely is definitely therapeutic it's definitely healing it's definitely cathartic um uh, but i I would never categorically say yeah that that thing is done now Um, yeah 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 no that makes sense do do you find yourself writing about the memories of your father um i have done previously i've not done with memorist yet um sorry i yeah, keep hitting on so that <laughs> no no it's no it's okay um okay not so much um i i have done previously i think because that was something that was so long ago mm-hmm. um as, as i said you know something else can happen and it will bring those things up like jack my friend dying um it brought all that back to the surface again you know, um, in a previous band I was in, as I mentioned that band Chronographs, my grandfather died. And again, it, it brought up those feelings again, that same kind of, um, that, that, that same feeling of loss and, and, and the gap that someone leaves in your life. And, you know, only a matter of months ago, another of my best friends died and mm. I went through exactly the same thing all over again. You know, I, I started to think about Jack again. I started to think about my dad again. I started to think about my grandfather. Like, it's not that I haven't wanted to. Mm-hmm. It's that I think it's been it's been tied in with the other things that I've experienced, the other things I've spoken about. Yeah, yeah. It's I love what you're saying, John. It, it, I mean, this is very special to me um, to have you be so forthright. Um, it's uncommon, I think, because obviously most people don't want to necessarily dig deep into you know, their personality profiles to talk about, you know, their, their mental health issues or love or loss or, you know, family strongholds like anger or addiction. Um, but we're all survivors, if you will, of mm. some, of some sort of behavior or experience. And I think it's crucial that someone like yourself with the talent you have continue to sort of lovingly, but loudly share right? Because it provides catharsis for you, but you are changing the game for listeners. I mean, have you ever thought about that? Have you thought about how much your words and the emotion that comes out of your voice, the expression affects the listener, that it's not just jamming and grooving and closing their eyes and saying, yeah, man, what a breakdown, but they're actually, in a sense, coming inside of you, coming inside of your mind as you sing those words out? It hadn't really until we released Loss. Um, 
I've I've always written personal things. I've never mm-hmm. everything I've always written has been has been personal. It's usually uh, had previously been laced in metaphor. Mm-hmm. Um and this was the first time I really written literally. And we had people reach out and say, Oh, I lost my friend, or you know, my father died, or this person died, or you know, this happened to me. Um and that song really resonated with them. And you you know, you, you read some of the comments on YouTube and like, this song really helped me. And like that was never my intention. That was you know, it was, it was, I mean, in, in, in the most selfish way, it was for me, you know, I wrote right. that for me. I wrote, I wrote, and for Jack, you know, I wrote that for me and for my friends. So I could, I could deal with his passing and I could commemorate or, or, or kind of commit to, to a, a record forever the way I felt about that man. Oh yeah. And other people then kind of picked up on that and were like, yeah, you know, this, this, this is the way I felt about my brother and my brother died or, you know, we, we had servicemen and women, um, from all over the world. Um, so, you know, I, I lost my friend in combat and this song really helped me. Mm. Um, and only from that point really did it start to kind of make sense. I was like, Oh wow. Okay. Well, you know, we're doing something that, you know, it, without trying to be arrogant is, is really quite special here. You know, yes. it's, it's something that could, that could help people, um, as well as it helps me. And, you know, if that's if that's possible, that's that's amazing. You know, I, I'm I'm totally on board with that. Um, I mean, music's for sharing at the end of the day, right? And and it is. We don't we don't we don't share enough. Um, people, I don't think that people don't share enough about themselves. They don't share enough about their feelings, uh, particularly in Western cultures. We're incredibly closed off. Um, right. You know. Uh, so yeah, if, if if that's the effect that it's having, then brilliant. <sighs> I think it's extraordinary, John, and you've actually quite literally um, bullet pointed my whole approach as an interviewer because my thinking, the reason my show is named Rockstar Superhero is obviously I'm trying to do my best to interview rock stars, right? Musicians, if you will, people of influence. But I truly believe that everybody has a superhero journey. And even though it's kind of cheesy to use the idea right now because superhero movies are the thing, right? Um, I love that. And I've been thinking about this for years because I really think there's four components to any human's walk. But if you look at it through the superhero story, it makes total sense, right? We have the origin story where you were born and you're typically clueless, right? (laughs) Right? And then there's this moment there's a shift in our lives where we discover our artist our, our excuse me our artistic capabilities and that ambition then starts us on this pursuit we're not sure what we're pursuing but we're going after it and then right. inevitably like in every superhero story there's a dilemma moment there's this extreme challenge where you say can i continue forward am what is what I'm doing helping society or harming it? Is it all about mm. me, right? And what I love about you is you're in the fourth stage. The reason you're having success right now, the reason you and I are talking, the reason people are talking about you is you've accepted your role. You've become super powered, if you will, right? (laughs) Memorist has become this thing that now goes out and sort of saves society through the particular brand of what you create, right? So, so, you know, for example, your lyrical content, right? The things you're talking about, these struggles or overcoming a series of emotional moments or losing a loved one, a friend, a parent, these are things we all deal with, but Mm -hmm we don't hear about them too much from our favorite rock stars. And the fact that you're willing to do that, John, and to be as open as you are today on this is extraordinary. So nothing but kudos to you, my friend. Thanks, man. I mean, yeah, it's, as I said, it's not anything that I ever really set out to do. Um, It sounds selfish. No, never something I set out to do for other people, (laughs) but if, if it helps people, if that's beneficial to people other than myself, then, that's that's wonderful you know I've, yeah i i have i mean actually to, to kind of round it back to an earlier point uh, i mentioned circus survive um mm. they've got an album called on letting go which is actually the the balloon is on my arm there right mm. um 
that that album literally changed my life um without it even being conscious i i went on a, a a trip with my school when i was younger i started listening to the album i fell asleep listening to the album i must have listened to it probably six seven times on loop and i <laughs> felt a very particular way when i fell to sleep um before i fell asleep i felt lost i felt um apathetic um mm. I, you know talking talk, kind of standard symptoms of depression you know what's the point you know why am i yeah. here what what should i even carry on and i woke up feeling completely different and i woke yeah. up from listening to that album on loop for however long yeah with a different mindset and mm -hmm. you know music's done that for me so if my music our music can do that for others mission accomplished like yeah happy days yeah, well, it, it will. And I don't think it's just catharsis, right? As you experience, there's a, I mean, there is truth to the idea of hypnotism, the scientists, the scientific aspects of hearing something subsonically, the subliminal aspects of music absolutely soothe the soul, right? Or if you're listening to some extreme, you know, black metal or something like that, it's going to light the soul on fire, right? You're going to, mm. it's going to, you're going to be bringing out the darker parts of the humanity because then there maybe is a need, the cathartic need to, you know, expunge that, right? To press it out there, to throw it out and vomit it away. So I, I love it. I, I love who you've become. Um, I love that you've shared that story and it's lovely. Um, Without torturing you too much on this, I, I did want to ask you one more question about the EP. Um, That's fine. I know it comes out, or I should say I heard it comes out in November. Yeah. Um, and you're with Year of the Rat Records, which I think is really cool because that's a great company. Um, what what has the relationship been like with them? Were you courted? Did you pursue them? How did you stumble across each other? Um, so I've known James um james ilsley the owner of year of the rat for years okay. um he actually used to um manage my old band so he runs a management agency as well called savior management um and savior used to manage my old band chronographs years 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 ago um gotcha. and obviously that finished and and you know we kind of drifted apart um i still had james on facebook good old facebook thanks mm -hmm. um and then <laughs> Out of, out of nowhere, um, during the, the pandemic, James popped up and he announced that he was starting this label. And one of the first signings to his label was a band that I had previously managed, some of the members. Um, mm -hmm. So there was kind of all these weird connections between us. Um, <laughs> and we had him land in our inbox um, and say, hey, guys, really interested in the band. What's next after our first three singles? Um, I sent him some demos. We pinged around backwards and forwards for a little while. Um, and we didn't really talk to anyone else, you know. We, wow. we didn't we didn't really kind of think about approaching anyone else. We were going to self release. We were we were going to start chuck it out ourselves and, and hire a PR guy. Um, and I'd always been really impressed with the way James operated. He was really professional, and he does an incredible job. Like for a one man show, like he's I mean he is a machine. Yeah. And that was it. Like we we signed a digital only release, um, and here we are. And I, 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 we owe a great deal of our, our current success to James. The Empiric wouldn't have done anywhere near as well as it did were it not for his abilities with Spotify playlisting and, and you know, DSP playlisting across the board. I mean, we've landed on Pandora, Tidal, uh, Deezer, yeah. Amazon, everything. Um, yeah. So that's that's really, really beneficial. Um, and he's, I mean, the idea of Year of the Rat as a whole is it's it's refreshing. So many labels are like, yeah, sign a three release deal um, and they bleed an artist dry. And yeah, yeah. then Absolutely. they sign them under these restrictive terms that mean, you know, come a year down the line, if you want to move to another, a, a better deal with a bigger label, there's a ridiculous buyout clause. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. James doesn't like that. He's, you know, the whole ethos of the label is to get young and emerging talent from here to here. Yeah. So that they're in a better position to bargain with those, bi those bigger labels. Um, and, you know, he's connected with, some, with his, us with some incredible people. Um, and between him and, and our manager, um, it's, so our manager's kind of been quiet for the time. It's our, our manager is um, uh, Ryan Kirby. Um, so the, he's the singer from Fit for a King, um, but he mm -hmm. also works for a management agency called Beacon Management Group. Um, between the two of them, the things that come next after this EP, I like, I mean, 16-year-old <laughs> me 
is going, <laughs> dude. <laughs> yeah. It gets better. Don't worry. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, so that 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 relationship has been um, prosperous to say the very least. Um, but yeah. I, I mean, I I cannot recommend James enough. I, I I yeah, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Yeah. Well, I will tell you, my own experience with him has been stellar as well. He was very communicative with me, and uh, obviously helped connect us. So I'm I'm very very grateful for him. <laughs> um, you know, uh, Chris McIntosh. I don't know if you know the band Caskets very well. But they yes. are they are on their way. And mm. Chris McIntosh has become a friend of mine. Uh, he's the bass guitar player for the band, um, songwriter, one of those guys, right? One of the big heavies, if you will, in that mm. band. And he's actually a fan of your band. Um, really? Yeah, well, I, it's true. And he and I were talking yesterday. And right. I, I said, hey, I'm going to talk to John from Memorist. And he's like, oh, man. He goes, you got to ask him this question. So I wrote this down. Um, he said, we really enjoyed your new song, Slither. What was it like filming underwater? And do you have any funny stories from the shoot? <laughs> um, so that was <laughs> that was probably one of the most nerve wracking experiences of my life. Sure. Um, I spent I spent two hours in a mermaid tank. Um, wow. So th there's this company right in the UK that trains mermaids for like shows and stuff okay. like it's weird man <laughs> yeah there's not a lot to do in rural england uh you get out to the countryside you go to texas they shoot cows with bazookas you go over here and they, 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 you know, I, I only make that reference because i know a guy who has shot a, a cow with a bazooka in texas in texas but anyway um, <laughs> that's awful <laughs> yeah that's terrible it was an, it was an awful oh, story but it yeah uh, um yeah good lord I'm sorry for the vegetarian anyway um <laughs> He, uh, uh, yeah, we, we did the shoot and it was, um, <sighs> it was chlorinated water and, of course. and obviously I'm, I had my eyes open for all of it. Uh, and I was in the tank for two hours, but we got like probably the best part of an hour and a half of footage, which means I was underwater for 75% of that time. Um, and the, the biggest issue actually isn't the eyes. It's the, the chlorine up the nose. Yeah. Like yeah. I never realized. And also I'm, I'm exhaling all the time to get yeah. the bubbles and, you know, and everything else to kind of like to show that, that image of drowning, which I hope comes across. Um, and yeah, the, the, it, it, it was just very strange, like being fully clothed um, and, and kind of bobbing around in this chlorinated tank. And, and then I can just about see through this, like, I mean, it's like four inches of glass because there's so much water in there. I can yeah. just about see Sean, our videographer kind of moving around. And my girlfriend came with me as well. It's kind of like a little bit of moral support. And I can just see her laughing in the corner. <laughs> and every time I pop up and I'm like, I'm streaming, I'm like, Ugh. and the, the mermaid lady is there with cans of Coke. She's like, Dr drink a fizzy drink. Like the, 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 the bubbles will help with your nose. And then like spraying my eyes with this eye mist. And I'm like, I'm a 29 year old guy from <laughs> the West Midlands, fully dressed in a chlorinated mermaid tank with some girl feeding me Coca-Cola and spraying my eyes with. Couldn't with, be like, better. It was just weird, man. It was just weird. <laughs> but the, the latter half of that shit, that, that was one part of the shoot. The other half, which was, um, you say, was it, is it Chris? You say Chris? Yeah. Chris McIntosh. Yeah. Yeah. Chris. I, I have to hit this guy up because um, I actually really like caskets. I liked them back when they were captives. I know. Um, I know. So did I. And uh, I, was, <laughs> what um, I, I did the little, did the little follow. Um, yeah. The, the, the latter half of that shoot was awful. Um, so we built, we, we always build our own sets, right? Mm -hmm. um we're quite diy in that respect so we found an abandoned building on a farm that is used to be an aerodrome during the second world war um and got permission of the guy to use it um asked him for a key to unlock the gate he didn't unlock the gate so it was a one and a half mile walk down this path which there were cows everywhere no bazookas don't worry no bazookas um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just the cows everywhere and like cow shit everywhere like it was it was weird and we shot it at night so during the day we had to haul all the stuff down there so we we, we built this set with black fabric um we bought um building waterproof membrane that you literally lay down to stop like damp in houses um then built like runners out of two before wood um and kind of in this room where we'd already swept away all the cow dung and everything else um Oh, yeah, we had to tape up all the windows as well with bin bags. 
created this like stranger things kind of on a thin layer of water um but in order to get the water there we had to buy like 300 liters of water in bottles from a costco and then carry it by hand that one and a half mile trip um yeah uh, because there was no running water um And it took like a day to set it up. And then we shot in the middle of the night and the shoot was horrendous and it was cold and we got soaking wet. Um, and I mean, again, shout to Amy, the the actor, like actress, sorry, um, who, who worked alongside me. Um, she was, she was amazing. She was a proper, proper good sport. Like there's me soaking wet and like, I've got cow shit on my boots and there's cow shit in the water and I'm slapping the water and the water's going in my eyes and there's cow shit in my eyes. And I'm like, this is just, <laughs> and like you watch the video back and you go, I'm like, this looks so cool. And then I remember, the uh, probably best part of 20 hours of struggle and pain. Um, and then after that, it was a, a four and a half hour drive at four or five o'clock in the morning from where the shoot was to my girlfriend's house. Um, and I turn up at the house and she's like, how'd it go? And I'm like, I just want to go to bed. <laughs> I just want to go to bed. Um, uh, our, our video shoots so far have been tricky. Yeah. So I'm hoping Friday, He's going to go off without a hitch. Yeah. Yeah. I I hope so. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Thanks to Chris for asking that question. That's a great story. Um, I thank goodness you, you were wearing contacts, right? Not for the slither one. No. Oh, really? You weren't? Okay. Okay. It was, was, it's hard to tell. So I, I assumed you were. Okay. Um, well, before I let you go here, um, you know, with the new EP coming out and, of course, you know, the promise of something following in the near future, um, what does the opportunity to tour look like? I mean, obviously, COVID has put a damper on everything, but it's also been the great equalizer, right? A lot of bands mm. coming up out of the ether bands like yourselves that I would have honestly probably never heard of, but I'm so grateful for because now you're clearly on your way. Um are you planning on your first approach just being around the UK? Is it even in the picture in your life? I mean, are you dreaming it? And and can we get you to the States? Because I can sell out a room for you. <laughs> Thanks, man. I mean, yeah. the States is the dream, right? The States yeah. is the dream. In fact, we have, we've got more fans in America, Canada, and Australia than we do in the UK. Yeah. Um, we're, more, we're more popular in Germany than we are in the UK. Um, wow. But, you know, that, what are you going to do about that? Um, Yes, touring is on the radar. So we've just taken on a booking agent. Uh, we've just signed with the Echelon Talent Agency. Um, who are, thank you. Um, a guy called Liam, who's um, who's a really talented booking agent, um, connected by James, actually, uh, which is fantastic. Um, and yeah, I mean, we are looking at touring plans for next year. Um, it's, it's what we want to do. Um, initially, the idea with the band was like, if it doesn't tour, it doesn't tour. Like, we're not bothered. But now it's like, now nah, we get, we we got to take this on the road. Yeah. Um, and we're in the process of building. Um, uh, so we're firm believers that if you're going to do something, you do it right. Um, and we're not about to turn up with a couple of amps and you know a, um, a, mm-hmm. a, a drum kit and, and and no microphone. Like we've got a live rig. Um, we've got full in-ear monitoring system that's that's kind of being built at the moment um awesome. as well as uh <coughs> all, all of the bells and whistles basically so that when we do come to perform live it will be an experience it won't just be six guys on stage playing at you it will be an experience it'll be a sonic experience and it will be a theatrical experience because thank god you know that's what we're about um yeah it's it, it's I'm, I'm not i'm not happy with bands that kind of jump up on stage and go yeah Hey, we're this band from this town by our EP. Rah. Yeah. It, it doesn't do it for me, man. Like, yeah. I mean, I saw Slope to- Sleep Token. In fact, funny enough, I saw the guys from Caskets at this at this show, the Heavy Music Awards. Um, right, right. Weeks back. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I didn't say hello because I'm like, I don't want to be that guy that says hello to that band and like, hey, I know your band. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. really lame. It is know? lame. Um, <laughs> so it's lame. I, 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 I didn't do that. Um, right. But, um, yeah, that that show Sleep Token played, and you know, you know Sleep Token. I don't. Uh, sadly, the UK we don't get a lot of your stuff here. I don't know why. Okay, but we don't. But I so do. Sleep Token is. I mean, Google it. Um, okay, he's a very, very, very theatrical artist. Awesome. Um, the 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 band is called Sleep Token, but the guy uh, refers to himself as Vessel. He wears a mask; you never see his face. Um, only a very few people know who he is. Um, and that was an experience 
Wow. Like it was, it was like being at some kind of demonic um, preacher type wow. thing. It was, it was crazy. Um, and that kind of inspiration, I'm like, if you can create something that's that involving for your audience, yeah. that's what you should strive to do. Yes. Yes. So that's where, yes. that's where, that's where we're aiming. That was a very long-winded answer to a quite a direct question. I'm sorry. No, it's a beautiful answer. The whole point of this, man, is to get the truth, not just the fiction, right? I want to hear the whole truth and nothing but, you know. Sure. Um, a couple of fun little things to end with. Um, when do you feel most like a little kid again? <laughs> uh, when I go to sweet shop. So, uh, or like if I go to the cinema, um, and I'm like, oh, can I have popcorn? I'm gonna have to, and I'll, I'll go mad. Like, <laughs> I'll get like the largest popcorn you do. I'm gonna get a hot dog. I want nachos. I'm gonna get a big bag of sweets. Uh, I'm gonna get loads of chocolate, and then I'm gonna sit there and gorge. And I get like a, you know, in America, you can call them a big gulp. Um, yeah. Over here, it's like a, it's like a, a, an ice glass. They're like that big, and it's yeah. like blue and yellow, blue and yeah. red slush. That, then I feel like a kid. Um, or for me, like one of the, the big moments of feeling like a kid is if I go into um, like a – in the UK, we used to call them penny sweet shops. Mm -hmm. um, they're not they're not pennies anymore. It's right. like quite a lot. But it's just right. jars and jars and jars yep. and jars of sweet. Love that stuff. And yep. you, yeah. Or like pick and mix. Pick and mix, same thing. Like you get a, a scoop and you put it in a bag and you weigh it. Man, I love that. Like, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Okay. So the, I'm going to – it's this is the last one. This is the last one. Yeah. It's, it's a little dark. But – okay. We got to go there, man. Um, if oh, you right. could, if you could choose the manner of your death, how would you like to go out? And you don't get to come back. It's not Groundhog Day. Like this is how <laughs> you're going. This is how you're oh, going to die. I wouldn't want to. I, I think that's it. Once I'm done, I'm done. Like you know, um, I don't know. I really don't know. I want to say quietly in my sleep, but I think that's quite dull. Yeah. Um, I also want to say sex induced drug heart attack, but I think that's quite, um, you know, I, I think that, yeah. Um, and uh, I think my missus would probably go, what are you on about? Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm, I, I think I'd have to say quietly in my sleep, happy with a full belly, um, you know, at, at, in my gray years. I know I'm gray at the minute, but that's, you know, that's, um, that's <laughs> out of the box. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. Um, yeah, happy. Actually, you know what? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna amend my answer. In a rocking chair on my front porch, in a warm evening, I can hear crickets, and I probably live in Texas. Oh my god! That would be I hope, nice. I hope. And right before you die, somebody blows up a cow with a bazooka. <laughs> no, there's gonna be no there's gonna be no bazooka cow killings on my ranch. It's gonna be it's gonna be. A really nice ranch. They're all going to be if they if they're killed at all, it'll be humanely. But they'll probably grow too fond of them, and um, they'll they'll be my friends rather than my food. Oh well, John, thank you for being super rad, man. I mean, you are an incredible. Uh, I almost said that wrong. <laughs> an incredibly powerful vocalist. I love your voice. It's crystalline. It's perfect. It just has this beautiful round tone to it. Um, I'm a hundred percent positive. You, my friend, are going to go all the way. Um, I truly love who I've met today and I'm inspired by you. So thank you so much for being here. And, um, I, I know my listeners are going to love what you're doing, brother. Rob, thank you so much for having me. And, and thank you for the kind words. Honestly, it's, um, it's, it's still kind of a bit like, I don't really know how to take it. I don't know if that's a British thing or it's just me, but yeah, mate, I, appreciate, I appreciate it so much. Thank you so much for having me and, um, and, and for taking the time to chat. Yeah.